Some of the most important aspects of nanoscale materials come not from any magical effects of excitons and absorption and scattering and all that cool optoelectronic stuff, but merely because the object is small. And the object being small can affect the properties that arise from two different ways of looking at the world. One is purely the continuum way of looking at the world where we ignore atoms and molecules. And the other way is the atomistic or molecular way of looking at the world. And let me give you a few examples of each. The first example has to do with the surface area to volume ratio or the strength to weight ratio uh, and or I should say and the strength to weight ratio of, of objects as you shrink the sizes down. Okay, picture a sphere and its volume is four thirds pi r cubed, right? And picture now its surface area and its surface area is four pi r squared. Now, as if you have a huge sphere like this, then okay, we can understand that most of the, that its mass is proportional to its volume. It's also uh, proportional to four thirds pi, uh, pi r cubed, and the surface area is what it is. But as we start shrinking it down, what happens to the relative ratio of that surface area to volume? So surface area, four, uh, four pi r squared in the numerator and four thirds pi r cubed in the denominator becomes some factor of one over r uh, one, one over r to the first power, right? You've got r squared in the numerator, you've got r cubed in the denominator, you've got one over r squared. The same thing goes for cubes. Say you have a cube that is uh, that is that has edges of r, r, and r, so you've got r cubed, and its surface area is like, what, six times r squared to volume, which is r cubed, and you've got some factor, in this case, six over r. To the first power. So, so these surface area to volume effects tend to go with some value over r to the first. Okay, so what? What does that mean? Well, when you shrink objects down to the nano scale or even to the micro scale, you have a much larger proportion of that object embodied in its surface area compared to its volume. So as a, uh, as, a, as a result, say you've got some really, really tiny, tiny R dimension, then one over R, that blows up. Now, if you have some uh, some really really big dimension, you know its mass you know effectively dominates, or its its volume or mass effectively dominate. And if you look at the uh, another effect, and this is the strength to weight ratio. Picture a hippopotamus. And a hippopotamus, picture it as a sphere. So its mass and volume, uh, it's, it's, its volume and therefore mass scale with four thirds pi r cubed. Now the strength of one of its legs actually scales with the cross-sectional area of one of its legs. And so that's some linear dimension squared. It happens to be uh, pi r squared, right? The area of a circular cross section of a circular leg. Now the strength to weight ratio scales with some linear dimension squared divided by some linear dimension cubed. And again, we have the one over r dependence. So therefore, if you take a hippopotamus and, or <laughs> let's, let's do it another way. Let's take a spider, right? Which has little spindly legs, right? Like Peppa Pig would say, Mr. Skinny Legs. You take Mr. Skinny Legs and you blow up the, the whole animal to the size of a hippopotamus and its legs would be a little bit thicker, right? But 
but not that much thicker. They'd be spindly legs, but holding up this huge hippopotamus shaped spider, and it would easily be crushed under its own weight. So as you increase the linear dimension, you have to have thicker legs. And that's true even with inanimate objects like tables. If you've got a heavy table, you absolutely have to have thick legs. If you have a light card table, say that you fold out the legs, they can afford to be pretty, uh, pretty skinny. But don't put a, a thick table with the same, uh, with the same uh, area uh, on top of those legs because they'll be crushed, right? And that's true whether or not we know anything about muscles or sarcomeres or whatever. It just comes out of the math. And that is a purely continuum effect. Now let's talk about molecular effects of size confinement. So if you take a cube that is you know, a million atoms by a million atoms by a million atoms. And now most of those atoms, because it's, you know, a million cubed, are going to be in the bulk, that is away from the surface in the interior. Now the chemical and reactivity and electrostatic properties of those atoms are going to be a lot different from those on the surface. For one, the atoms on the surface are less tightly bound there because they don't have as many electrostatic or van der Waals or metallic or covalent interactions with all the other atoms in the bulk. And that makes sense, right? Because they're kind of unsatisfied there. Now, if you shrink that down, say you've got, uh, say you've got a structure that is only four atoms on each edge. And now you have uh, you have 64 atoms in the structure, and if you do the arithmetic, you have 60 of the atoms are actually touching the surface of the object, and only four of the atoms are actually in the bulk. So now most of the atoms are on the surface, and that comes out of this atomistic or molecular picture of size confinement, which is it, it produces properties in addition to the mathematic or mathematical or continuum uh, model of how size confinement works. And what are some properties that arise from this atomistic or molecular picture? One of which is chemical reactivity. So when you have catalysts, catalysts are notoriously uh, more catalytically, catalytically active. Well, notorious is like a bad connotation. They're like... Um, Famously, <laughs> they're famously better if there's a lot of inter or a lot of external surface area that can react with the different uh, with the different reactants that bind to the surfaces. The physical properties of these nanoscale confined structures are also quite different. For example, you have a melting point depression because those take our four by four by four. Uh, atom cube, those atoms on the surface have less cohesive energy associated with them overall because they don't have as many van der Waals bonds with uh, other, other atoms in the structure. So they'll melt sooner in a way that's predicted by, uh, by this, um, this equation where lambda is some characteristic skin depth which is a couple of nanometers. R is a critical dimension, and uh, and then we have the uh, the confined um, value for the uh, uh, for the uh, the melting point on the left, and then the bulk value um, on the right, which is modified by these other parameters. So these are just some of the ways in which size confinement has a uh, has an important role in uh, in nanoscale engineering. There's an example um, that I uh, talk about in the book where when I was in grad school, I was running current through a nanowire and I found that each one of the nanowires would be, would be conductive for a, a brief second and then it would be a short circuit. And then when I looked under SEM, scanning electron microscopy, I found that the interior of the wire had melted. And it melted not because the melting point of gold is particularly low, which it happens to be, but because it was a nanowire, because most of the atoms were the, had these unsatisfied valencies on the surface, there was a lot less cohesive energy, and thus the melting point uh, was lower.
The same thing, uh, the same effects are actually responsible for why water striders and certain kinds of pygmy geckos can actually crawl uh, on water because the surface tension is sufficient to hold those animals, uh, those animals uh, aloft. There are also effects on Brownian motion of size confinement. So the smaller your uh, your particles, the farther the object can uh, can drift and diffuse. Because statistically, the more likely the Brownian uh, kicks that it gets from other particles are going to kind of be asymmetrically opposed, and thus they'll end up farther away from the starting point than a bigger particle. So all of these effects arise from size confinement, some of which have to do with the math, and that is a continuum effect if we ignore atoms and molecules, and others come from the fact that there are atoms and molecules that make up matter.